Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today, and I'm pleased to take you through uh, this deck about somatic gene recombination in the brain. And my name is Gerald Chun. I'm at Sanford Burnham Previs Medical Discovery Institute in La Jolla, California, where I'm a professor and senior vice president for neuroscience drug discovery. Uh, what I'd like to uh, tell you about is some, some recent work uh, looking at uh, a potentially new mechanism, uh, both for fundamental brain science as well as Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we're located in La Jolla, and here's a picture of our institute. Uh, it's right next to the Torrey Pines Golf Course, for, for those of you that have uh, uh, predilection for golfing, a lovely place. Come and visit us. So I'll start with a very basic uh, level of uh, understanding, and that's what's present in textbooks about DNA. And here's something that came from the National Human Genome Research Institute, and it was a question and answer day and they were asking uh, people in the audience uh, to send in questions. And this question came in, do all cells have the same DNA? And the answer that was given was, yes, of course, all the cells in a person's body have the same DNA and the same genes. And this is the answer you'll get from most uh, textbooks these days. And yet, when it comes to the brain, it's absolutely clear that this is not true. And that's because of the existence of genomic mosaicism. So a way to think about this is uh, in the next slide, a, a picture of a yellow rectangle. And let's assume that that rectangle, rectangle is composed of billions and billions of cells that have identical genomes. And what that means is that all of the organization, all the exquisite uh, complexity that's present in our brains must arise post-genomically. However, there's another possibility, which is that uh, that complexity, that organization, actually involves changes at the level of individual cell genomes. And if one were to look at that in another way, you could actually have functions or organization emerging from these individual cells that are different at the level of their DNA. And that new order could arise uh, from that kind of organization. And that's what drove a lot of the studies to begin to look at the individual genomes uh, within the cells of our brains. The first evidence that something was distinct came from looking at uh, brain development. And that's shown in the next slide in which uh, we looked using what at the time was quite uh, modern, but is, is now an established technique to look at the chromosomal complement within individual uh, neurons or neuroprogenitor cells in this case of the brain. And this was using a technique called spectral karyotyping. And what it does is it, in essence, paints chromosomes different colors. And so what you can see there in the center image is that this progenitor cell has three chromosome twos, a single 15 and a single 17. And that's uh, arrayed uh, in the diagram at the bottom. So it's clearly aneuploid. And it's aneuploid in a quite complex way. And one may ask, why wasn't this observed in the past? And I think part of the reason is shown on the pictures on the left and right in black and white, that you uh, really couldn't easily see what that complement of chromosomes was using classical types of uh, DAPI on the left or G banding on, on, on the right. So this type of an approach led to the view that indeed many, many cells within our brains uh, would actually or could actually vary at the level uh, of chromosome differences. So these are aneuploides or technically aneusomies uh, if they're occurring within cells where you don't know where all the chromosomes are. And uh, if one looks at where the field has moved in the last uh, couple of decades or so, uh, that's shown here in terms of forms of neural genomic mosaicism. So from that initial observation in 2001 of uh, aneuploides, uh, a number of other observations have emerged that indicate that it has meaning affecting gene expression, occurring in circuits, uh, and uh, a number of other phenomena have subsequently emerged that indicate that other forms of mosaicism also exist including line one elements from Rusty Gage's lab, uh, DNA content variation that I'll have more to say about uh, in just a second, uh, 
Uh, then the era of single cell sequencing uh, that is upon us from Chris Walsh's lab that indicated there may be some of these L1 elements uh, being uh, emerging or entering the genome, although at levels that are still uh, under investigation. But single cell sequencing has revealed uh, copy number variations, or CNVs, uh, that's indicated uh, in the black there from work from both uh, Rusty's lab and our own with Kun Zhang at UCSD. And then uh, moving to single nucleotide variations work from the Walsh lab, as well as Kristen Baldwin at Scripps Research, uh, indicate that individual neurons can have quite an array of uh, single nucleotide variations that can be identified. Uh, one possible sequela of this is uh, changes in the transcriptome in single cell transcriptome studies that we and Kun Zhang have done indicate an enormous level of diversity that's present amongst neurons of the human brain. Of course, many investigators have shown that in the mouse brain, and that might in part be due to this complexity uh, within the genome. Uh, the last point to make in this slide is the mosaicism uh, does change uh, with conditions, and in particular, we found that in Alzheimer's disease, uh, it can change quite dramatically, and I'll spend uh, the latter portion of the talk telling you about that. So one of the techniques we've used to get an, a view of many, many different cells uh, at one shot is simply to look at their DNA content. And the way to do that is to take individual cells and isolate their nuclei, which allows you to uh, use a cell analyzer uh, that, that employs fluorescence to look at uh, DNA content after you've uh, stained the DNA with any number of fluorescent dyes. So uh, that, that's illustrated in a very simple way in the left and on the right. If you look at the writing there, DNA content analysis, uh, the way these experiments are done is you put in your experimental sample, that's the big peak, and then you spike in a positive control, which are chicken erythrocyte nuclei, and then you can line up samples uh, from different sources. Uh, so using this technique, we were able to assess changes uh, within the brain. And I should add that uh, this general technique is now widely used uh, to look at uh, everything from the genome to transcriptome in cells of the brain. So here we have an example of some of the data that emerged to reveal DNA content variation. And if you look on the far right, there are three samples in blue, green, red, and they've been overlaid. And so in each of A, B, and C, you can see chicken erythrocyte nuclei form a single peak. And these are all three experiments overlaid on each other, and they are uh, basically the same. However, if you look at the samples from the cerebellum, uh, there's a little bit at the base along the x-axis, <laughs> a little bit of uh, spread there. And that, what that indicates is some variation that's present uh, along the x-axis, an indication of some DNA content changes. And that's even more dramatically seen in cells from what's labeled as frontal cortex, where you have that right shoulder. And if we move to D, you can see that that right shoulder is colored in magenta. That, that's a significant change in the uh, distribution of these cells. And it's occurring among cells of the uh, frontal cortex. Uh, these cells can be seen in uh, an orthogonal, orthogonal view uh, to the right in E. And that's a scatter that's uh, to the right of the image and cells from the frontal cortex. And we now know that almost all of that uh, extra DNA that's present there is within the neuronal component or compartment, although some of the non-neural cells may also contribute. Uh, the amounts that are gained are not subtle. It's some 250 million base pairs or 250 megabases. Another way to look at this is to take your samples from that DNA histogram as shown in the gray uh, picture in A, and then isolate them and then whole genome amplify them and simply ask about uh, how much uh, amplification one sees from your uh, fraction. And if you do that for, say, 100 nuclei, 500 nuclei, or 1,000 nuclei, you get changes as shown in B where the low portion always is less than the high portion. Not surprising, but independent uh, validation for these relationships. And this is work done by two great graduate students, Diane Bushman and Gwen Kaiser, as well as uh, Ben Sidaway, a postdoc in the lab. 
So this brings us to Alzheimer's disease. It's the most common cause of dementia, huge uh, societal and economic costs, some $277 billion per year in the U.S. We still do not understand the most common forms of the disease that constitute about 99% of cases, and they're called sporadic because we don't understand uh, what uh, is causing them. There are no disease-modifying therapy, therapies, <coughs> excuse me, uh, despite hundreds of failed clinical trials, and about only 1%, by impo an important 1%, are linked to rare genes in families, and these are so-called familial Alzheimer's disease uh, cases. And one gene in particular is amyloid precursor protein, or APP. This gene is pathogenic if it's mutated or present in three copies, as occurs in Down syndrome, where basically everyone gets Alzheimer's disease by the time they're about 40, or the neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease, or rare familial forms uh, of uh, APP uh, duplication that also has three copies. All of those folks get Alzheimer's as well. So APP gains in copy number are extremely important in familial and in Down syndrome Alzheimer's. It's important that one has difficulty, or it might in some cases basically be impossible to detect these kinds of changes occurring within the brain if you're using standard ways of looking for human disease genes. And these are, of course, GWAS types of studies, genome-wide association studies, because you take cells from the periphery and you isolate their DNA and then you sequence them. And why? It's You're not actually interrogating cells from the brain itself. And if you have these large changes, say 250 million base pairs in a given cell, you won't be able to see them using these uh, peripheral sources of DNA. So what does one see in the sporadic cases? And uh, if you take cells from the prefrontal cortex, as we did, but now we're looking at Alzheimer's disease, we see even more increased DNA content variation. So uh, what's shown in this slide are mosaically increased uh, DCV in Alzheimer's disease neurons. And the gain is about 450 million base pairs over reference, or another 200 million base pairs over uh, a non-disease case. And once again, you're looking at uh, three different uh, situations, the lymphocytes versus two Alzheimer's disease cases in red and blue. And uh, if you look at the uh, D for the uh, cortical samples, you can see that there is an increase in the DNA content within those populations that's not seen within the cerebellum from the same individual. So this is something that is, shows regional variability as well. And once again, we have about a 450 million base pair increase over reference genomes. So what might this mean for Alzheimer's disease? Um, well, one is to ask the general question of how pervasive is this? And basically, if one looks at a population as shown here in F, uh, you can see that there is a statistically significant increase as one goes from person to person. Each of those little uh, diamonds is an individual brain and cells from the cortex of those brains have more DNA. On average, uh, you can see, or the means are indicated by the red bars as compared to the other conditions that don't show the same uh, increase. In G, H, and I are different ways of looking at the distributions of these cells, whereby, again, in the cortex, one sees more DNA and there's more variability in I, uh, an indication that there's more going on within these populations. So if one uh, asks the question of what this might do to uh, Alzheimer's disease, a clear possibility is it might affect that APP gene because it, uh, as I mentioned earlier, increases in both Down syndrome with three copies or those families that have three copies in all of whom will get Alzheimer's disease. I should add right off the bat, there was no evidence for increased trisomy 21 in sporadic Alzheimer's disease. There is trisomy 21, interestingly enough, but it is not increased over non-disease controls. So we looked at this in a couple of different ways. In one way, we looked at it uh, using a fluorescence-based technique that did not require polymerase amplification. And in the other, we looked at it using a single-cell quantitative PCR. So let's take a look at the fluorescence first. And uh, this is the way we uh, approached it by using what are known as peptide nucleic acid probes. And uh, you, these are used for telomere studies. Uh, we stick on a single FLUR onto these probes, which can be hybridized against uh, a given target. And we targeted 
a three prime and a five prime exon. So the five prime exon here is in the purple star, that's exon three, and the three prime is the exon 14. And then we visualize them using uh, structured illumination microscopy. And then we also tossed in a positive control, uh, which was uh, a telomere, which shows up in red. So you're gonna see red and you're gonna see green. And that's shown here in the next slide. Let's start on the far right. You can see a cell from a normal brain uh, with all the red signals there. And uh, one does not see the endogenous loci with uh, this approach because we've thresholded it so that we don't see them. However, in the cell below it, uh, you can see a green dot. And that green dot is an indication of a locus that has more than two uh, copies. And in fact, probably has several copies of uh, APP. Uh, is this indeed a uh, good representation of what's going on? And if one looks at the quantitative PCR uh, signals coming from these samples, this time not using brains, but using individual cells as shown in A, uh, you can see that uh, out there on the far right of that, uh, where there's a star, there's Alzheimer's disease cortex, that all of those uh, little cells indicated by diamonds show increased uh, copy number uh, above what one would, would see under these other uh, non-disease conditions or cerebellar conditions. So that's an indication that, is, that there are more copies. And in some cases, as many as 12 copies were observed uh, by qPCR. And right next to it is the, the histogram of fluorescence output that also shows a similar shape. So two independent techniques uh, support uh, this view. But there were a couple of interesting oddities, if you will, one was the morphology of these signals as shown in this slide, where uh, you can see that the green dot, let's start at the very top going from left to right. Uh, the little circle there uh, indicates that there's more copies, but if you're simply adding more copies to the circle, you might expect it to stay a circle, but that's not what was observed. Uh, some copies like in the second three were kind of blobby and at the very bottom, really blobby. So there's some real inhomogeneities in the signal in, in fact, it looks as though some portions of it have increased signal over the other, as shown uh, in the far right, that's showing the, uh, the heat map with red being more, uh, more signal. Moreover, if once again, we looked at qPCR to look at the relationship between the exons, uh, we saw something that was actually quite uh, supportive, and that was discordant exon pairs. So here we're looking at quantitative PCR, and each of the cells at the bottom, one through 23, are single cells. And we've looked at both exons in those single cells. And what you can see is that there's general concordance. However, there are lots of examples uh, where it's not concordant. And those are the purple and green stars where exon 3 or 14 may be over or under uh, represented. And it was that difference that really suggested that something else was going on besides uh, there's been simple whole amplification of the gene. And that led us to look quite closely at what was going on and resulted in uh, this paper, somatic APP gene recombination in Alzheimer's disease and normal neurons. And it was driven by Ming Shang Li, a great postdoc in the lab, and then uh, a whole uh, really excellent team of researchers uh, who are shown here, Ben, Billy, Christine, Chris, Gwen, Igor Tao, Rich and Grace. And I'll be showing you work next that, uh, that the team uh, was able to uh, pursue. Now, part of having a team is that one can uh, have people do things over and over again to make sure that we're not making mistakes. And in fact, as shown here in the next slide, uh, this table, which is uh, from the paper, indicates nine distinct approaches that were reproducibly carried out in the lab that support uh, what I'm about to tell you. And actually, if you take those nine and you add it to the three other techniques uh, from the uh, work that I just mentioned, uh, looking at the, the uh, increase in fluorescence and qPCR, that's some um, 12 independent or distinct approaches that uh, support the existence of somatic gene recombination. Just underscore that uh, there is reproducibility uh, for these data. One may ask uh, right off the bat, why didn't we just go ahead and sequence these single neurons? It seems like that te technology exists, but in fact, it does not exist. And it's shown here. And the problem is that the coverage is very, very low for this type of sequencing experiment. So for example, in uh, 
Rusty's uh, 2013 paper, the coverage there was 0.013x. And today, even the best coverage is only about 0.1x for a single cell. And similarly, the resolution, generally somewhere in the ballpark of a number of megabases, uh, even the best uh, current resolution is still only about half a megabase. And why does that matter? It's because the APP locus itself is only 0.3 megabases, 300 kilobases, and it probably requires something on the ballpark of about 400x coverage to see something. And thus, it's uh, just not possible to identify uh, the sorts of changes one might want to see using uh, the standard types of sequencing technologies. So to get at it, we approached it in a couple of different ways. We looked at both RNA and DNA. But remember, this is a mosaic situation. And so rather than looking at a whole bucket of cells, we just looked at a few at a time in order to capture the diversity that might be present. So here's a general approach, first with RNA, and in other pictures, you'll see a DNA, just to distinguish what we're looking at. So here in the first uh, set of figures, uh, in A, we're looking at the brain, taking the neurons, taking their nuclei, and then carrying out reverse transcriptase PCR to look at their RNAs. And in the gel that's illustrated to the right in B, what you see are a bunch of bands that have little arrows on them, and there are other bands as well. Those are bands that are not supposed to be there. They're smaller than the predicted forms of the RNAs for APP. And those are illustrated, uh, the expected types of bands are illustrated in D, E, and F. So D is the genomic locus, which then gets spliced to form a full-length or so-called 770 variant. That turns out not to be expressed in brain because the brain has brain-specific forms, that's shown in F, and there's a 751 and a 695 that lack certain exons, turns out exon 8, exon 7 and 8, respectively. Those are what uh, we expected to see. But all these little bands, what, what are they? So in C, we did an old-fashioned southern blot with an internal probe to the primers, and it lit up, so that said, hey, maybe it's something interesting. Uh, we cloned them by, by standard <clears throat> methodologies and Sanger sequenced them. And what we found were a whole bunch of little truncated forms, and those are illustrated here. And uh, the nomenclature is uh, the RNA for the R and then the exon 1, say, slash 11 on the far right. And then they're just different numbers of uh, varieties that we saw of that particular form. And these are truncated APP forms. They're characterized by having these cDNA-like portions. And in addition, they have these intra-exonic junctions that are joined via homology regions from one exon to the next within the exon. So it's not the exon-exon of a, a splice junction, but rather something that occurs within the exon itself. So all of these forms have not been previously reported. But of course, there's that horrible possibility that maybe this is some PCR artifact. So to get around that, we looked at a completely different uh, bit of information. This is from a library made commercially by Pacific Biosciences using single molecular real-time sequencing. That's an important uh, uh, new technology, relatively new technology that allows one to look at single molecule sequence rather than requiring a comparison to a reference. And what this showed is that the same types of intraxonic junctions and truncations uh, were present in the messages of a completely independently derived uh, library, arguing against any kind of an artifact. So where is this coming from? And as you might imagine, our bias was that it was coming from the genome itself. So uh, we began to look at that. Let me add that uh, I'll be showing you some pictures with varieties that show the 316 on the far right, or 1617. These are uh, some of the species that uh, uh, we sequenced and we made specific probes against them. So here we are now in DNA. And uh, if you, we did exactly the same thing of uh, taking a few cells and we PCR'd, but this time no reverse transcriptase. So we're looking at genomic DNA. And there's a gel there on the right. And once again, you see small bands. These small bands are not supposed to be there, but they were consistent uh, with the RNA. Note that there's one group there. Uh, it says uh, SAD3, and there's some smears in there. I'm going to come back to those smears in just a second. Uh, in addition, uh, we carried out a DNA in C2 hybridization using probes uh, 
that allow you to see actual genes, but using in situ hybridization. Very, very importantly, we could do this using the sense strand, not the anti-sense as one uses for RNA in situ hybridization. And so this allowed us to help differentiate it from RNA. <clears throat> Lastly, we did a pull down as shown in number four of that section, which allows you a completely independent method to uh, try to identify things that look like genomic uh, cDNAs. So here's an example of the DNA in C2 hybridization or DISH. So the sense and antisense in E, H, E and H are two different uh, forms from the, the uh, 1617 and 316 targets. And you see pretty much the same signal as you would expect and especially the sense strand is uh, showing it uh, an indication that it's not RNA, it's, it's in the DNA, and that's supported in k &M where we uh, restriction endonuclease destroyed the target sequence. Uh, we also had positive controls with using retroviruses with synthetic targets that also indicated specificity. So we're looking at a DNA signal here, and what you can see is that there are, in fact, quite a few signals in some cases and that's uh, illustrated in O and P, where you can see the endogenous, this case where we, we are revealing the endogenous signal uh, with two alleles in the magenta arrows. And then the greenish, bluish arrows, they show, as for example, an O, a whole bunch of signals, an indication that we're seeing with a sense strand in DNA targets that are identified. And in some cases, there are quite a few of them within single cells. Finally, uh, looking at the pull-down, uh, we see uh, sequencing reads that are present on all of the exonic borders that are normally a characteristic of a cDNA. Note that in this uh, array, we see that we're missing exon 8. Why is that? It's an indication, we believe, that there's a requirement for an RNA intermediate and that it then gets copied to produce the cDNA. And we refer to these within the genome as genomic cDNAs or gen cDNAs. So what about that smeargram that I show you in, uh, just now? And that's illustrated here where we see the smearing. That's an indication that there may be quite a bit of diversity. So uh, we use a different technique to look at this. And that is some of the same uh, SMART sequencing that I had mentioned. And if one uh, looks at what came out of that analysis, we get what's shown uh, in the next slide. And so the general approach is once again to take a few nuclei to PCR in two. We actually use a nested PCR. We got products uh, in three, and then we could uh, put on our adapters and then sequence. And what this uh, approach allows you to do is to sequence the same template over and over and over again. And as a result, you can get very high certainty uh, sequencing scores, something on the order of 99.999999 certainty, and uh, that's comparable to Sanger sequencing. And that allows you to see things uh, that you might not be able to see with just a few passes of the polymerase. And here's what we saw. Uh, looking at E on the right, it's a circle plot, and on the very outermost rim are the exons 1 through 18. And what you see immediately uh, going into the center are the intra-exonic junctions that are present, and then the dots uh, that are present in a log score in the concentric uh, circles that are an indication of deletions, insertions, and single nucleotide variations. And so non-disease brains do give you signal, but Alzheimer's disease brains give you a lot more signal, and that's shown on the far left, where we see lots and lots of dots, and those are of many different forms. And let me call your attention to the A beta region, that red streak, and then looking at the dots uh, near uh, that A beta region, you can see some with red uh, around them. What are those? Uh, in the next slide, we can see what they are. They are, in fact, pathogenic mutations, or uh, the same as what uh, are seen in uh, familial disease, but now they're occurring in sporadic Alzheimer's disease, and they're absent from disease controls. So these are single nucleotide variations that are identical to the uh, familial forms, but they're occurring in these pathogenic, uh, occurring in sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the last thing to note here is that, in fact, there are many changes that are occurring uh, within this population, particularly if one goes from 
H, we can see that there's a number of different forms. The black and the gray are in fact what one normally sees with the splice variants, except they're in genomic DNA as compared to, excuse me, to F, where we see there's a vast change in a loss of those black and gray and a replacement by other colors, an indication that there's a big shift in the different types of uh, forms. As one looks at the relationship to Alzheimer's disease further, uh, we can see that uh, there's a marked increase in the Alzheimer's disease neuron uh, signals as shown in A and quantified in B and also in D and E, such that we see a signal in neurons, but not the non-neuronal populations, and they're markedly increased in Alzheimer's disease. This is also supported by an animal model in which, uh, which has been well studied called the J20 mouse. It too shows some of the same variants, even though it was not produced with these variant forms, uh, that's shown in G. And the endogenous signal actually increases with time as shown in I and J. And it only does so within the neuronal compartment. And this is a transgene driven by a neuron specific promoter and indication that transcription is in fact required for this process and that uh, it changes over time, just as Alzheimer's disease requires time to manifest. Lastly, uh, if one looks at the production of these um, genomic cDNAs, uh, one can see that it requires at least uh, three different uh, components. One that I had mentioned earlier is gene transcription. The second is that DNA strand breakage is required. And the third, reverse transcriptase activity is required. Uh, I won't take you through all of the details here, but what I can say is that uh, one can produce uh, in cell lines these genomic cDNAs, although interestingly, their sequence is a little bit different uh, than what's seen in the brain, perhaps an indication that there are other factors that are also involved, and that's shown in C. But in addition, if one looks at uh, H in this picture, you can see we're looking at reverse transcriptase activity, and it does exist in the brain. That's important in that it's an indication that there's some endogenous source of reverse transcriptase activity that is yet to be determined. There are a good number of different aspects of uh, genomic cDNAs that are noted here, and in the interest of time, I won't belabor it, other than to say that uh, there are indeed a number of elements, novel elements that characterize these. Most prominently, they are the genomic cDNAs, and they require this combination of gene transcription, strand breakage, and reverse transcription. So one might ask, why does this matter? Well, one thing is that the brain really is a genomic mosaic, and it's at a mosaic at multiple levels with multiple different types of analyses, the most recent of which is uh, somatic gene recombination. Secondly, one can look at this from the standpoint of molecular biology. And of course, we all know that DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein from Watson and Crick. But uh, we also know that for viruses, as shown here, uh, that it can get reversed so-called reversal of the central dogma going from RNA to DNA, and that's, of course, through reverse transcription, and that is uh, a, an, a critical part of the retroviral life cycle, and uh, most prominently for the retrovirus HIV. But now we can add genomic cDNAs to this, certainly for APP, and we believe for other genes as well. So this is a phenomenon that does that reverse process involving normal and modified cellular genes. Uh, in normal neurons, this uh, appears to occur through this process, going from double-stranded DNAs to your pre-RNA that's spliced and copied and then goes into the genome to form the genomic cDNA. And this might be important uh, for uh, taking activity-dependent recording of a gene, perhaps one that's preferred or modified and allows you to strengthen connections by selecting for a given uh, unspliced or previously spliced version of the gene that gives you uh, particular selective um, capabilities. And it may be something underlying what's known as a Hebbian, as Hebbian plasticity or Hebbian synapse, neurons that fire together, wire together. Uh, perhaps this contributes to that process. What about in Alzheimer's disease? Well, the same types of things can be going on, but we believe they, they go wild, they go awry. 
And uh, if you look at the bottom of this process, you can see that it might hit specific genes or other genes, could generate thousands of new genes, which might explain clinical trial failures that look at only one molecular species, or could have adverse effects because of insertion, like uh, some mobile elements do. But in addition, if the cycle uh, is iterative and it goes round and round and round, then one would also have the problem of creating the uh, or encountering the sloppiness of the reverse transcriptase that produces more single nucleotide variations, which is exactly what we observe, some of which appear to be uh, pathogenic in their um, similarity to familial disease. And that raises a really interesting possibility because there is a disease that's been treated with reverse transcriptase inhibitors, HIV, uh, through their combination antiretroviral therapies that include these reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So we can ask a couple of, of questions. Like one is, uh, what's the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in general? Well, it's about one in 10 people uh, age 65 years and older. And if you look at the number of people that have HIV and are of this age, there are about 120,000 of them now. So that would predict there'd be anywhere from, say, on the were average 10%, 12,000. If it's just 3%, 3,600. If it's 17%, 20,400. But anyway, thousands of cases. And so how many cases have appeared in the peer-reviewed literature? And in fact, in 2016, the first case. So one case has appeared thus far, and uh, that was based on um, a positive amyloid PET scan. So that raises the possibility that uh, perhaps there is some type of relationship that can be accessed now using FDA-approved reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And in fact, sort of independent analyses of insured databases is showing up similar types of trends. So we feel quite excited and uh, optimistic that this may, in fact, be, uh, be reachable in terms of what might be used for patients. And that's the last slide is to uh, iterate that, that there are no approved disease-modifying therapies for Alzheimer's disease, and these reverse transcriptase inhibitors are FDA approved for both HIV and hepatitis B, and so it's possible that uh, they could be utilized. And in the US, there are options already on the books for non-approved agents. However, we're talking about approved agents that could be uh, prescribed off-label. It's important to note that all of the different agents that are currently under investigation will not have the years of post-approval safety that these agents have until long after the current crop of Alzheimer's disease patients is gone. So there is the possibility that uh, these agents could be used today. This leaves uh, this final slide uh, showing the different forms of uh, mosaicism. Uh, of course, the, the CNBs, the SNBs, the aneuploides, and now we can add a gene recombination uh, to that set. Exactly which form acts when is still an important thing to determine, but uh, it raises the possibility that there's a lot more that can be understood both in the normal and diseased brain, and it suggests that there may be new therapeutics on the horizon for treating genes that are affected by somatic gene recombination, including FDA-approved reverse transcriptase inhibitors. That, I thank you all for your attention and uh, want to recognize many of the folks that have uh, done this work, as well as support from the Schaefer and Bundy Foundations and the NIH. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to, to uh, take questions by email. Um, so uh, please send them my way. And uh, once again, thanks for your time.